And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that's in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is in your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder, and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid, and trembled, and they stood far off, and said to Moses, you speak to us. And we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, these commandments are solemn. They are substantial. And even as we re-examine them, Um, We do so not flippantly, but reverently. And even as we examine the third one this morning with regard to your name, Father, set apart your name and your character this morning in our midst. Set it apart in our minds. Set it apart in our hearts. Set Jesus' name apart as the only source of our soul and body salvation. Would you do this for your glory? Would you do this for our joy and our good? In Jesus' name, amen. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It's a popular adage from a popular line from William Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. And even if you did not have a classical education, you not, were, you not, were not forced to read Shakespeare in high school, uh, even if you haven't watched West Side Story, you most likely know that term, and it, it's uh, used by Juliet to, the, to argue that it doesn't matter that Romeo is from a rival house, it doesn't matter that he's from somewhere else, that these houses, these two are not supposed to like each other, that he by any other name would be sweet to her, he would still be handsome, he would still be Juliet's love. Even if he were not Romeo, he were named Ron or Robert, then he would still be just as sweet, just as kind, just as handsome, just as attractive to her, regardless of his name. What's in a name? Well, in Shakespearean plays, that's a great question. But what's in a name? When it comes to God, that answer means everything in the third commandment. What does it mean in the third commandment when God says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain? What does that mean? Well, it means, actually, that we're going to see this morning that we'll see bearing God's name, we'll see bearing God's guilt, and what's good news? Bearing God's name, bearing God's guilt, and seeing the good news. And in regards to bearing God's name, I've got, I've got three explanations here. We're, we're supposed to reverence the Lord, be responsible with our lips, and represent God legitimately. First of all, what's it mean to reverence the Lord? See, this doesn't just mean... Uh, I know this is a proof text a lot of times for parents who don't want their kids to swear. Um, But it's much more than that. It doesn't just mean to use God's name flippantly, although it does mean that, and we'll get into more of that later. Taking this name, this word take in the Hebrew here means to carry or bear along. Much as they would uh, traveling through the wilderness, they would bury, uh, take or carry their possessions. They would take or bear along the Ark of the Covenant. How do you... 
God's name. Well, in, the, in the text, oh, we don't do it in vanity, emptiness. We don't do it in frivolity, frivolousness. We don't do it in emptiness. We don't use his name as a byword. We don't tack it on to other names. Why does it mean this? Because God's name just doesn't mean the nomenclature, the, the names he's means. It it's, means his whole character, his whole presence, his whole revelation. The, the word, the concept name stands for all of God's work and all of God's word. All of God's work and all of God's word. It is not just his name, God. It is not just his name, as he's revealed here in Exodus 20, Jehovah. It is his whole character and it is his whole work. And we see this out through the Old Testament in Genesis 6. The writer says here that men begin to call on the name of the Lord. In Deuteronomy 12, Moses says, God puts his name on the 12 tribes for his dwelling. That's where his name will dwell, his character. He will set it apart through this context of this people. And even in the book of John's Revelation, in Revelation 13, John says that the beast seeks to blaspheme the name of God. He seeks to undermine the work and the character of God. So how does this work out? How does, how does it work out that, that we are to bear God's name, bear God's character along in everyday life? Well, first of all, we need to reverence the Lord. Several catechisms here ask, what is required in the third commandment? The third commandment requires the holy and reverent use of God's names, God's titles, God's attributes, God's ordinances, his word and his works. And, and we sort of get this, right? We sort of get this. We get the fact that we are supposed to be holy and reverent. We're supposed to use God's name properly. But we understand this. You, you don't let your kids call you by your first name. That Your mom and your dad. You don't let your kids call their teachers by their first name. Oh, how was school today? Well, Betty gave us too much math. That's not how that works. It's Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. We're in a military context. In the military, you surely don't call a commanding officer by his first name. Hey, Jack, what's on the agenda today? What are we going to go blow up today? No, it's colonel. It's captain. It's general. It's lieutenant, etc. Why do we reverence the Lord? Because he demands it. Remember, these commandments are not just naked, bare commandments because God doesn't have anything better to do. No, they come in the context of a covenant God coming to be with his covenant people and after 400, 400 years delivering them from the bondage of slavery, from the house of Egypt. A covenant God delivering his covenant people because of his covenant promises. These demands are not grievous, as we said. Remember, the Apostle John says, we know that his commands are not burdensome. They are not grievous. Rather, they grow from a relationship, and every relationship has rules. God demands it. We reverence the Lord because he demands it, but we reverence the Lord because he deserves it. Again, God is setting part his name. Why? By taking people out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, out of the house of bondage. Why? That they may worship him in a land he has set apart. Old Testament theologian John Golden Gay says the difference between God and us is that God never thinks he's us. The difference between God and us is that God never thinks he's us. God deserves it. We, and we break this command when we are irreverent or flippant with his word or his works. We break this when we complain because in, a, in essence we're saying, God, what you did wasn't good enough. God, you should have done it a different way. We break the, th the, the third commandment when we Monday morning quarterback what we think God has done. You know, we, we, we rightly understand this, don't we? We take greater care of our expensive kitchen knives than we do that rubber spatula. Oh, that rubber spatula, where is it? Is it in the drawer? Probably. Is it on the floor being used as a, as a little hockey stick? Maybe. Is it outside digging sand and cleaning up parts of the yard that you want to be there? Maybe. You would never do that with your kitchen knives. Never. 
we have different decorum if we meet our governor than when we meet our tax guy. We understand that, that there are certain roles, certain uh, people that we reverence apart, and God is above them all. So we, 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 we bear God's name properly when we reverence the Lord. We, we bear God's name properly when we are responsible with our lips. Another catechism, what is the aim of the third commandment? That we neither blaspheme nor misuse the name of God by cursing. And that doesn't mean like, like a swear, but that means cursing another person. Cursing or perjury or unnecessary oaths nor share in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. We break this when we use his name as a byword. When we curse others flippantly or out of order. And, and I'll just say this as a parent of three small children, how, how we personally handle swearing, it may help you. This is not binding on anybody. This, this is just what we've decided to do. Uh, in this world, it's hard to... to, to Insulate kids from ever hearing a swear word. In fact, one of my children uh, several years ago came home and said, Dad, you're up, and he, and he inserted the word. And um, I, after my wife and I um, held our emotions in, we asked, Hey, buddy, where did you hear that word? I don't know. What does that word mean? I don't know. Well, and this is what we say. We say, buddy, that's a grown-up word. You're not grown up, so you can't use that word. That is a word that some grown ups choose to use, and we won't. We won't. We don't use that word. That's how, that's just how we handle it. Other other writings go on to say all sinful co- cursings, oaths, vows, and lots, violating of our oaths and vows, not fulfilling them, murmuring and quarreling at, or curious prying into God's decrees and providence. Do you study God's word because you want to get the inside info or do you want to study God's word because you can bow to his name and feel wonder and awe and joy at his works? Do you study his word so you can own that guy and just blow up that guy in that theological argument you're having online? Or do you study God's word because you want to find out more about what he's done for you? When we misinterpret or misapply God's word or pervert it in any way, we are breaking the third commandment. We don't use God's name as a means of bringing a curse on someone else. We don't lie under oath. We use God's name with severe weightiness. And when we are under a legitimate oath, like in a courtroom or on the stand, we tell the truth. That is part of of bearing God's name properly. We, we do not, we, so we, we reverence the Lord, we, um, we, re, we are responsible with our lips, and we represent God legitimately. We represent God legitimately. And, and some may not have unpacked this part, like, when you, when you get to this commandment, okay, okay I'm not going to use my, my words, but it has to do with our actions as well. Thomas Watson, one of the Puritans who writes on the Ten Commandments, says, pretended holiness is double wickedness. Pretended holiness is double wickedness. Jen Wilkin, in her book, Ten Words to Live By, says, to, to misuse the name of the Lord, to take his name in vain, is to misrepresent the character of God. Doing so misuses his reputa- reputation to suit our own needs, speaks of or to him without accuracy or due respect and miscredits him for self-serving actions done in his name. To misuse the name of God is to commit an act of defamation against Yahweh himself. Why is it a big deal that we represent God legitimately? You know, the Pharisees tried to skirt God's authority, and they tried to take side vows so they didn't have to fulfill their duties. In some places in the New Testament, they ascribe to demons what is ascribed to, to what should be ascribed to God's Spirit. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are ambassadors. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador represents one country or one entity to another, and he represents the best about them. 
Look, when our ambassadors go to different countries, they're on their best behavior. They want to mind their P's and Q's. We even do this with our own children. Like One of the things we say to our kids when they're going to a birthday party or that we've tried to instill in them and go to school, hey, who are you? You're, you're a Cornwell. That means something. In the same way we bear, we are... Our baptism is like a family tattoo. We bear the name of God on our hands and on our lips. In Acts 9, at Saul's Saul's conversion to Paul, God says that Paul is a chosen vessel to what? To carrying God's name. There is a missional act in bearing God's name. Did you know that? As baptized believers, we bear God's name and character to our city, to our county, to our state, and wherever we go. There is a missional act in bearing God's name. Why do we pray for our city and our area? Why do we pray for the CSRA? Why do we intentionally go into our offices and our hospitals and our schools and our parks and our rec centers and our restaurants acting a certain way? Because we bear the name of Jesus Christ on us. We are ambassadors filled with the Holy Spirit being sent into those various areas. That is one of the reasons why your work is important. Whether you're flipping burgers or crunching spreadsheets, whether you're cleaning the bathroom or running the boardroom, it is vital work because you bear the name of God. So we need to ask ourselves, how are we misrepresenting God? Are are we misrepresenting God to our kids when we're overly harsh with them we are misrepresenting God to them when we don't do the hard work of of guiding them along and disciplining them we are misrepresenting God when we look down on them we are misrepresenting God to them I alluded to this in our confession that we, when we pray, but we don't believe, we are misrepresenting God's name. Why? God says, I long to hear your prayers, and I delight in your name, and I hear them because you have the Spirit praying for you. I hear them because Jesus is interceding for you. And when you pray, but you don't believe, you are taking the name of God in vain. Do we have an improper view of sin? Sin isn't too small that it's not important, but it's not too big that it can't be forgiven. Sin is not too small that it's not important, but it's not too big that it can't be forgiven. So we, we bear God's name. And God says here that, that the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And I don't think it's any surprise that in our day, blaspheming God's name, saying something reckless about God... Using God for your own gain, it's commonplace in our, in our day. As many of you know, I grew up in a conservative environment, and we, we would go over to some of my friend's house. And I remember we were over, over my friend's house, and um, we wanted to watch some kind of movie. And he asked, he said, Mom, can we watch a movie? And I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. Italian lady said, It better not be one of those swear machines. Better not be one of those swear machines. And I said, well, buddy, dude, what's a, what's a swear machine? He goes, that's one that has a lot of swear words in it. Oh, okay. She didn't want to, us to watch that. Because in her house, rightly so, she, she didn't want that. She didn't want to hear that. She didn't want her kids hearing that. In the same way, God cares about his name and his reputation. He cares that he is rightly represented. We bear the name of God. And when we don't bear it properly, we are breaking this commandment. It's the third one. See, the first one, it says, don't have any other gods in my presence. The second one is, don't use your imagination to make another god. The third one is, God, is represent God rightly. So why, where is good news here? Why is this good news? Why is it good news that God is so protective of his name? You know, I, I don't know if you 
maybe got, went to a certain restaurant growing up, and then you went away for college, and you came back, and you went to that restaurant again because you remember the food was really good, and you remember good times there with friends and family. And then they brought the food out, and it was meh. It was meh. Maybe the portions were a little smaller. Maybe, maybe they hired a different cook, and it just didn't taste the same. Maybe they got it from a different distributor, and it just wasn't the same. You're a little disappointed there. Their, their name, the name of that restaurant went down a few you know, as, as I said, my last name is Cornwell. Most of you know that. And you can imagine what happened to that name in the unsupervised middle school boys' locker room as we were ready for gym class or for soccer practice. You can imagine some of the variations that came out there. I'm not allowed to say some of those. One of those that did come out is the name, and my wife does not like this to this day, the name Corndog. I went to a homecoming at my alma mater, and I heard that name gloriously and blissfully. Why do I allow myself to be called corn dog? Do I like corn? No, I don't like corn dogs. They're gross. You know, I, I, I lost a sponsorship deal there. I know that. What, what is that name? When someone calls me corn dog, when my soccer coach and my Bible teacher in high school called me that, when one of my seminary professors called me that, what does that mean? It means that someone is comfortable with me. It means they are comfortable with me and that there is a level of our friendship that we have reached that they are okay being around me and that they're putting up with me for all my unfunny jokes, for all my um, good, bad, and ugly. It means they are good enough with me. What does it mean that God has given us his name? Why is it good news? Do we have somebody? Like, I, I don't know if you thought about this just in the 20-some minutes we've been together as we've unpacked this. The, the third commandment forbids all profaning and abusing of anything whereby God makes himself known. That the Lord won't hold him guiltless. I, I don't know about you if you felt this pressure like, my goodness, is that what's involved in this thing? How do we do this? If only we had someone who could bear the name, who could represent and be the perfect ambassador. If only we had somebody like that that could do that. If we could put our hands and our eyes and our ears on someone who is the perfect representation. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. He is the revelation of the Father Par excellence. He's the word. We get to act towards God the Father just like Jesus did. Why? Because we are made in union with him. And that for all our name vanity that we're guilty of, he has come and died for that. The very son of God, the very exact representation of the Father, the one who did this third commandment perfectly, spilled his blood so that we don't have to be held guiltless. How crazy is that? Who would ever think of that? That's God himself working in space and real space and real time, sending the perfect revelation so that we can know what God is like. What does God think of me? Look at Jesus. How does God feel about the people in our church? Look at Jesus. How does God feel about all those kiddos over there? Look at Jesus. How does God feel about the person who bears the image in my office? Look at Jesus. We read that this morning, that there is no other name, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other source of salvation for our souls, no other hope of restoration for our bodies. No other hope of redemption for the entire cosmos than the name Jesus Christ our Lord. We are privileged here at this church that God has set his name on us at our baptism. That's why when whether we baptize a baby or we baptize a new convert, we baptize them what? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We are set apart to receive his blessings. We are set apart 
to experience his work. We are set apart to enjoy fellowship with him, and we are set apart, that's right, to bear his name on our mission. That's why the number six blessing and the Deuteronomy 28 says God has set his name on his people. That's how amazing this is. See, God is protective of his name, as he should be. My dad grew up on a dairy farm in Kentucky, and, and for the better part of my younger years, whenever we visited, we stayed with my grandmother, and the farm was still going on. The cows roaming everywhere, hay up in the loft, an old pear tree, and, um, and some, of the, some of the fields... We were pretty much allowed to go to every field, but we knew that if we went to some of the fields, let's just say we had to be careful. Be, not because the cows were mean, but, but the cows left their carrying card. And in those fields, we had, to, we had to, as the King James Version says, we had to walk circumspectly. Walk circumspectly. And in my small grandmother's farmhouse that had two bedrooms, and no air conditioning upstairs in the attic. She had this, this, um, these two curios, one with, one with the china and one with my dad's trophies. We ate fancy meals off the china. We didn't go shovel the calling cards with them. Why? Because it was set apart. We understand this in our own souls, that there are certain names, certain people, certain things that are special that we hold dear to ourselves. So we act in a certain way. We act in a certain way. We do not take the name of the Lord our God flippantly on our lips, and we don't bear our lives in public because we know God's name is sacred. It is unique. His character and his work are unmatched and unlike any other. Got three kids. Um, my oldest just turned nine last week. My Middle child turns seven the week before, and my, my daughter turns five next month. And my oldest, um, he's, uh, I, I joke around, he's nine, going on 16. Um, but growing up, I, I didn't really catch it until a few years ago, that when he's excited, he wants to show me something about his new Zelda game, or about his schoolwork, or about his, his rec league football he says, Dada, blah, 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 and go off on his request. He says, Dada, no one else on this planet calls me Dada. And one day, one day he might not, but today's not that day. I heard him call it to me yesterday, and I thought, no, no one else on this planet calls me Dada. Holding my son, holding my oldest. He's the only one that does it. Because no one else is allowed to do it. There's only one. It's unique. And it's special. And it means we have a certain relationship. We get to take upon our lips and in our hearts up to the Father. We get to take the name of God Almighty and we get to call him Father, the one who spoke words to existence, the one who gathered his people and struck Pharaoh and made the Red Sea into dry ground, and the one who sent his son, and the one who rose him from the dead, and the one who promised that he will send his son back for us and will make all things new, that amazing God we call Father, and we get to take his name on our lips. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's, it's amazing that we get to call you that. Um, it is really delightful. Forgive us, we pray, for taking your name. Forgive us for using it as a byword. Forgiving it for using it out of a sort, uh, out of a, a source of frustration. When we hit our hand, or we lose something, or somebody puts us in a bad mood, forgive us. 
Lord, today, on this your day, and throughout this week, let our hearts revel in the good news that you've set your name upon us. Let our hearts revel that we get to use a unique term, Abba, Father, just like Jesus Christ did. Seal to our hearts the reverence and the awe of your name and the accessibility that we have as children. Father, set our hearts on the mission you've called us to. Whether it's in the OR or the coffee shop, whether it's dropping off our kids, whether it's picking up the mail from the post office box, give us great joy and delight and reverence for the fact that we bear your name to our neighbors. We ask that you would do this, please, for the sake of your name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In a moment here.